We've got questions on Boer people in South Africa, church architecture, and Charles gives a legitimate approach to Byzantine succession. Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with an elodial Charles Coulomb. Oh, wait a minute. I have to stop you there. Now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be, crusadechannel.com. You're saying? Uh, well, I don't know. Now I feel like I'm on talk radio the way it should be. <laughs> yeah. At crusadechannel.com? Yeah, whereas before I was elodial, but now I'm, I'm talk radio as it should be. On crusaderadio.com. Crusade radio? No, Crusade you channel. can't say that. My Crusade truth will beat you up. Com. Okay. Crusadechannel.com, Mike. There, I got it. Yeah. Elodio. So, what, so that means that I'm the lord of the land. I'm the complete master of my own property. Yes, your property. I have no feudal master. Yes. The government are incapable of taking my property for eminent domain. Yes, correct. Oh, that's good to know. Here I am, ladies and gentlemen, the lord of the land. How does it feel? Powerful. <laughs> All you serfs, get to work. <laughs> that... I feel great. I feel wonderful. I feel like a, a, a great territorial magnate. We are going to force Biden to the field at Runnymede and make him sign Magna Carta. Wow. He and Kamala will be there, and I'll be there with the bishops and the, all the other barons, all the other allodes, and we will compel the creatures in Washington to sign Magna Carta, too. Magna Carta, too? <laughs> yeah. Won't that be great? That would be great. I, I think we can. Running me is a little far, and it's in England, and he, he'd probably get lost. He don't know where he is. Maybe we should at Arlington National Cemetery. Why? We'd be close to JFK's grave. Oh, okay. See? Yeah. We could sign it right by the eternal flame. You mean the ev eternal flame? No, this is, well, it, 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 theologically, <laughs> you're right. It would be ev eternal. But they call it the eternal flame. And do you know why? Why? Because it's gaslit, so it never goes out. Mm. And it's gaslit, not unlike the American population. Plus, plus, yeah. with JFK right there, we could rededicate ourselves to a new crusade, to a new endeavor. This generation must ask itself, or rather, what was I saying? Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Yeah, that famous quote, and it's famous because no one thinks that way. Yeah, and also because he stole it from Charles Evans Hughes. But, but, I promise that we will have a man on the moon by 1970. He, did he say that? No. He was right. He was. We he, did. Yeah. I Game promise. over. Yeah. We win. <laughs> At <Yeah>. life. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened, all right. <laughs> we won. And Nixon said we'd have an American, and in 69, we'd have an American on the Mars by 1980. Did he say that? No. We, we missed that one. Yeah, I guess. Maybe 2080 at this rate. Yeah, it's going to be a bit. Oh, well. Angry Red Planet. I, don't, I didn't see that one. No? Mars Attacks? I literally, not only did I see that, but I saw it with you and my uh, brother-in-law and and my brother. Huh. That was like actually a really epic thing. I don't know if that's literally ever happened before, but for that movie, everybody was there. Ah, Mars Attacks. Yeah. Ah, uh, woo. <laughs> it's not unusual to be loved by anyone. You got to see Tom Jones with his Martian backup band. That's right. How often does that happen? Not very often. No. No, Mars Attacks was a fun film. Yeah. But that's not all. There's more? There's more, indeed. Indeed, indeed. Not an actor. Act now while supplies last. No, 
Uh, there's a lot, actually. Okay. We are in Thanksgiving week. And as you noticed, we are here in the old studio, which is now re totally refurbished. Um, unlike the, uh, it's, uh, unlike the uh, mail room, it doesn't have a wet bar. I don't know why that is, but it doesn't. And it's a, um, Thanksgiving week is always an interesting time. Because, although you've got Christmas decorations everywhere now, uh, in my day, it was Thanksgiving weekend that was the start of the Christmas uh, season, commercially speaking. You have the, uh, it was the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. You'd have Santa Claus come riding in at the end, which was the case in the Hollywood Christmas Parade, the Santa Claus Land Parade, as we called it, down Hollywood Boulevard, which would be on the Sunday of the weekend. And then you would see Santa Claus come in at the end, which would mean he would take up his position at various department stores, uh, laying in wait for the children to find out what they wanted. And that was the beginning of the commercial Christmas season. The trees would go up, you know. Yeah. It was beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Everywhere you go, there's a tree in the Grand Hotel. There's one in the park as well. You know, the sturdy kind that doesn't mind the snow. You know what you have to do uh, in your stay here is you got to go to Hastings Ranch. Yes. Well, Hastings Ranch, uh, Christmas Tree Lane on Santa Rosa, and St. Albans Drive uh, in San right. Marino. Yeah. V really nice neighborhood where literally everyone has incredible lights. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's the type of neighborhood that makes me wonder if somebody signs some contract that, yes, I will participate in the Christmas lights for every single uh, as, season. Uh, as one of the requirements for living there. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. But Mr. Balian is gone, so the Balian house decorations are gone. I know. There's an even crazier one, though. Um, over, more, more to the... Um, well, I don't know if it's further west than Balian, but um, it's like a forest of lights. Literally, it's one of these mansions, and it's just endless. It's incredible. I have to show you a picture, oh. but um, yeah, but yeah. Sorry about the Balian. That was a classic. That was, but the others are still with us, and you know, one of the uh, one of the things that I have to admit, despite that I don't like the holiday creep, you know, but having said that, uh, the funny thing is that. Despite their best efforts to transform Christmas into holiday and eliminate the Christian element, they never they can never quite succeed. And one of the things I love about the, the Christmas season proper is that it's the one time in the year where the whole world has to stop and take notice of Christ. And um, it's fitting, really, that in days gone by, <coughs> in the English-speaking world, the celebration of Christmas was seen as the mark of the anti-Puritan. Mm. It was a political thing. And, you know, today, the gift giver in England is Father Christmas, who's been basically annexed by Santa Claus in recent years. But originally, it was very different. And he was, in his origins in the 17th century, he was seen as the personification of Christmas, fighting as an ally of the king against Cromwell and the Puritans. That was the beginning of Father Christmas. And, uh, oh, I am old Father Christmas. May I never be forgot, as the Mummers play puts it. The, uh, yeah, dear old Christmas. All right, how about Book of the Week? Funny you should ask. The Book of the Week, forgetting about Thanksgiving, which is, will be on Thursday, and it's coming up, our Puritan holiday. Are you going to pardon a turkey? N I am not going to pardon a turkey. I'm going to execute a turkey. No. Um, by the way, Brian in Texas, super fan Brian, I wonder what he does for for um, for um, Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving because he actually is very, uh, he's a farmer, and he, he right. kills his own chickens, and then he eats them, and he is... Totally holistic in that sense. So, I, Brian, let us know in the comments what you do for 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 Thanksgiving. I'd really love to know and show pictures too on Facebook. 
And let's not forget the uh, the annual performance by the secretarial pool of Turkey Lurkey Day. Turkey Lurkey Day, that's a staple. They, they will stand up on their desks and they will dance and sing Turkey Lurkey Day. You looking forward to it? Uh, yes, it's one of those things where... It's good. It's yeah. good. You know, it, it represents that time of the year, you know? All right. So, How many chafing dishes are you giving out as gifts this year? Why would you ask? Well, I'm just curious because three of the girls have gotten married and they probably all want chafing dishes. Um, I don't know what a chafing dish is. No? No. It's one of those uh, things that would heat food in. There's a little gas flame. And... You've never seen a chafing dish? Heats food and there's a gas flame. No, we use microwaves. <sighs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. It sounds like some sort of pro, like propane, like some yes. pro, portable propane. No, I'll show you. You're right. I can't show you. No, uh, yeah, it's okay. I can continue living life without full knowledge of chafing dishes. Oh, that is coming from an Andrew. Yeah, no, <laughs> chafing dishes by the uh, end of the day. All right. But anyway, uh, so, Book of the Week. Book of the Week. Well, we're going back in time. The Book of the Week this week is Washington Irving's The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Cram. This is a collection of often unrelated stories and, and observations and all that, written by Irving at different times during the course of his career, um, and edited several times by him in the course of his career. But several of them jump out. One, of course, is Rip Van Winkle. One is the uh, uh, Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. These both made their appearance in the sketchbook. But there's a lot of other things he wrote in there, including a couple of stories, four of them, in fact, that revolutionized the celebration of Christmas in the English-speaking world. What? Yeah. He wrote some books that revolutionized revolutionized the celebration of Christmas. Uh huh. What are they? Well, they they're called Old Christmas. They well, they're, they're 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 one after the other in the sketchbook. There yeah. are four of them. To answer your question, uh, in colonial America, Christmas was celebrated to a degree in the South by the Anglicans, and to a degree in New York, particularly by the descendants of the Dutch. It was not celebrated in New England or wherever Calvinist ideas took hold. And even in the Catholic and Anglican areas, it wasn't a big deal it became. Although it had been big in the Middle Ages, as we mentioned, and as we mentioned, Father Christmas was, you know, well, let's just say that people who kept Christmas well in England, were considered to be quasi-Tory conservatives. Okay. So what happened was that Irving uh, became aware of Christmas in New York, thanks to the, his Dutch neighbors, and he loved it. Hmm. But then he goes, in about 1810, I think 1811, he goes to England, and he gets to know Sir Walter Scott. Now, Sir Walter Scott, as you may know, is one of the people who helped to make the Middle Ages popular again in England. And in some of his writings, he dealt with Christmas, which was particularly unpopular in Calvinist Scotland. But he single-handedly reminded people of its existence by poems describing medieval celebrations of Christmas. Irving comes to England. He comes to uh, Scott's house in Abbotsford and is blown away by uh, Scott's dealings with Christmas. But Scott says, you think I do it well? Ho ho. And he sends him to a friend of his down near what's now Birmingham, Squire Bracebridge, who lived in a place called Ashton Hall, or Aston Hall, which is still there. I, I was there last year, actually, I saw it. And there he found a latter-day attempt to keep up the old medieval Christmas in all of its grandeur and glory. So he falls in love with it. He writes his four sections on Christmas for the sketchbook, which becomes wildly popular, the book, I mean. And he acquires a young fanboy, and that young fanboy's name is Charles Dickens. 
And Charles Dickens, some years later, inspired by Irving and Scott, wrote A Christmas Carol. And that, and the uh, importation of the Christmas tree to the uh, British court by Queen Victoria's German husband, Prince Albert, really shot Christmas ahead in the Anglosphere, and it's never looked back. The, are you saying Christmas tree originated from the Christmas Carol? A Christmas Carol? No, it originated from Germany. Okay. But the, the it became popular because Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, brought it over. Oh, okay. And these two things happened around the same time. Okay. The Christmas Carol and the coming of the Christmas tree to so, England. So, I mean, they didn't have social media back then where they're, they're posting on Instagram pictures of the Christmas tree, so... I mean, that's spreading word of mouth? No, no, they had magazines, they had uh, pamphlets, they had illustrations. What time period was this? 1840s. Wow. Okay. I will show you Chambers' book of days when we're finished, and you'll see. Okay. Okay, uh, so on to the questions. We've got uh, a couple questions from Zenix, uh, new patron. Yes. Um, New patron, but old old uh, viewer. Old viewer, like years, years and years. Finally jumped in. Um, great time to become a patron. Pre shows are really cooking. I I know we did a public release last week. This week, no public release, but another good pre show. So um, consider becoming a patron. All right. Uh, Zenix says I have a question directed at Charles with his insights, and once more directed at Vincent, who has a special way of giving certain spiritual advice. For Charles, what's the legitimate approach to looking at Byzantine succession when court intrigue and overthrowals, for example, Irene, interrupt normal hereditary processes during its course alongside the theological problems, undermining the papacy, schism, Florence seemingly not really applied, etc.? The historical turbulence seems to muddy the waters regarding the legality of the whole thing. So, yeah. Well, it's a very hard question because um, the Byzantine succession was, to be brutally frank, chaotic. Okay. Even as he describes. And legitimacy was such to not really play a part uh, until the last dynasty, the Paleologoi. So, so okay, for those of, who, you, of us who are not familiar, what does he mean by the legitimist approach? Well... In Western Europe, the idea is that the senior uh, line of every royal family are the ones who should be ruling. And they have tended, in places like the, uh, the Braganzas in Portugal, the Bourbon in France, the Bourbon in Spain, and various other dynasties, uh, the elder branch has upheld the idea of a traditional Catholic monarchy, and the younger branch has got along with the idea of an English-style monarchy. So... Uh, the, 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 the basic thing here is that it wasn't just uh, about genealogy, but also about the type of monarchy that the country would have. Now, legitimism is the idea that the particular bloodline has the right, and that trumps every other issue, mm. although these other things are connected. So the problem with the Byzantine succession is that it was never quite regular. It was very irregular, in fact. Uh, it's, it's almost impenetrable for Western, to be yeah. honest. But the last house to rule the empire in the last 200 years, the Paleologoi, they, they had something approaching a proper Western succession. And the last of them, not the last emperor who died, a blessed fighting uh, against the Muslims in, in Constantinople was conquered. But his great great nephew, who was childless, sold the rights to the Byzantine Empire. First to the uh, King of Spain, then to the Holy Roman Emperor, then to the King of France. So it's a little bit of a, a bit of a con job. Wow. That's amazing when somebody sells something. Somebody sold the papacy, right? And it was like, ha-ha, I can't sell the papacy. Exactly. John the <laughs> Twelfth. 
Man. But he pocketed the money each time. All right. Um, all right, so is that, is that your answer? Is it my answer? Yeah. I mean, the, um, if you could find, there's still Paleologoi today. Uh, as there are several of the other former uh, Byzantine imperial families, uh, the legitimists would say one of them would have to be put on the throne, preferably descendants of Constantine and the female line, if not the male. Okay. All right. All right, so you're sticking with Constantine. I are. All right. Uh, and he says, uh, for Don Vincenzo, uh, that's me. Uh, can you tell us everything about self-mortification? A big question, but Charles can't be the only one adding to the watch time. That's right. Wow. Um, you know, this is actually a good time to, to ask me um, because I have just been absolutely uh, binging on Father Ripper videos. I actually literally just finished his book. Um, it's a big one, too. Uh, the Introduction to the Science of Mental Health, um, which is kind of an overlooked book by him. Uh, which I highly recommend. Um, I think a lot of people had questions about psychology um, where they don't, like it's a little off. Mm. Um, Father Ripperger sort of fills in that gap and explains why it's off um, in a word because they don't recognize the soul, they don't recognize the components of what a human person is made up of, the ill, or the ill, the will, the intellect, um, appetites, passions, stuff like that. Um, Anyhow, um, mortification, though, I tell you, um, that, that's really, I am horrible at mortification. Uh, I am such a pleasure-seeking individual. It's really, um, well, that that's what men are. That's what I think uh, Father Ripper stresses this, where sort of hmm. women have this thing with control. It's like the sin of Eve, where it's like, you're looking to control things, but then men have their thing is um, being effeminate, right? They're uh, uh, being uh, going after comfort all the time. No. Uh, but I can tell you my all-time favorite inspirational quote. Even though people have told me it's not an exact quote, it's a little bit abridged. It's uh, from Pope Benedict uh, when he says, uh, "The world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness." And that, that is such an important quote because that literally impacts, that's there, that's, that represents the choice of literally every single decision you have in life. Where it's like you can go with comfort or you can go with greatness. Um, and so, um, so mortification, I, I, the other thing obviously is, um, I mean, other than seeking comfort, why do you seek comfort? Because you fear suffering, no. right? So mortification gets you to handle suffering better. Um, and that is sort of, I mean, that's kind of the ultimate virtue if you think about it. Because if you're not afraid of suffering and you're suffering for Christ and everyone else, You are a hero by definition. You you actually are a hero. Like like congratulations, you've achieved hero status. Uh, pick your branch of hero. You know what I mean? Like 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 that is true freedom right there that you've attained. And now you, all you have to do is decide where to put your energy now, <laughs> as an unstoppable force. Um, so it's a four on fire now. <laughs> oh, song, old right? time song. But no, I mean, I feel so strongly about this for men. Um, I, it's a huge problem. A lot of people uh, have talked about this. I know in the Catholic sphere, I constantly hearing, har him, hearing them harp about it, and they're very right. Um, but I think the big thing that, that really inspired me from uh, with Father Ripperger is that he talks about quieting the passions, quieting the appetites. And how to do that, basically. Everything's changeable. A lot of times we get in ruts, we don't think it's changeable. But he makes the point that um, what is virtue but a good habit? In other words, if you do something hard, if you do something good, if you do it enough times, it's, you're developing that habit and you're actually changing your, your brain. You're actually changing your brain. 
and you're making things easier. Um, and that is really inspiring to me because that tells me that anything is possible. Um, so, and I could go on forever, um, but um, I thought I'd try to just give my flavor uh, of the matter compared to Father Ripperger because he talks about it in a very dry way, so I thought I'd just give my, my style on that. Um, okay. Zenix also says, I am once again in the sorry position to ask ye to pray for my departed, namely my grandmother who just passed away. Please keep the repose of her soul in your prayers. God have mercy. Uh, so, yeah, let's say it. Father, 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 Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Uh, in the um, eternal rest, grant her, O Lord, and the perpetual light shine upon her. In her soul and souls of all the faithful departed, the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, William says, please have Charles talk about the history of the Boer people in South Africa and Namibia and his opinion on efforts to preserve their heritage. I've started researching South African history and I've heard of a settlement called Orania. Okay, well, just like the Dutch settled New York, in the 1600s they settled the Cape of Good Hope. And they left settlers there to grow stuff for the company, the, West, the, the Dutch West India Company. And they left Indonesian slaves from uh, Indonesia. And these peoples, these, these Dutch and, and others, grew. They um, established Cape Town, and now it's the Western Cape Province. Uh, they conquered the, the Bushmen and the, uh, the Ricklers and various other tribes uh, until the whole of what would later be Cape Province was under their, their control. The population expanded very highly. Over the centuries, the native Dutch became Afrikaans. They were, in a certain sense, like the French Canadians, except that they were Calvinist. The Dutch were formed. Uh, so they sat until 1795 when they were conquered by Great Britain. Well, a lot of them, they did not want to stay under British rule. So beginning in the 1820s, they made what was called the Great Trek, where they fled into what's now Natal, Orange Free State, and the Transvaal. Uh, they, like so many Calvinist peoples, they radically identified with the children of Israel in the Old Testament and saw their expansion uh, into Matabele land and all that. They saw their expansion there as an extension of the kingdom of Christ. Uh, they also um, began to settle in, in what's now Namibia, which then Southwest Africa. The uh, Cape province was British from 1795 and then a group of um, Boers who had gone to Natal, a part of the Natal Republic, well, they were annexed. So Britain had these two colonies, the Cape and Natal. And then there were the two Boer Republics, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. The British fought a couple of wars with them, culminating in annexing the uh, Transvaal and Orange Free State in 1903, I think. So. That was the end of, of the Boer Republics and the beginning of their lives as British colonists. But then the British came up with a small idea in 1909. They had federated their colonies in Canada into the confederation uh, called the Dominion of Canada. They did the same thing in Australia with their Australian colonies, which became the Commonwealth of Australia, whose name was New Zealand. And so uh, as a result of a conflict between the Governor General of the day in Canada and um, uh, the government, what was passed by Britain was the Statute of Westminster. This allowed the Dominions, of which the new Union of South Africa was one, to become basically independent countries. Um, the, the, the King was King of the Cape Province, King of Natal, King of Orange Free State, King of uh, Transvaal. Amongst the uh, the Union of South Africa, was, as it was called, fought alongside the British 
in World War One and World War Two, although the bitterness of the Boer War was still very much around. Um, the Boers produced a very important statesmanlike figure called Jan Smuts, S M U T S. Well, they were Calvinists, very anti-Catholic. Well, after 1948, Smuts and the gang were defeated by the Poles, and the uh, nationalists who were dedicated to founding a Boer Republic took over South Africa. And they began the imposition of an apartheid republic, bit by bit. In 1961, uh, they abolished the monarchy and made it the Republic of South Africa. And apartheid became very, very rigid. Uh, so you couldn't marry whom you chose, that kind of thing. And then eventually, after the fall of the Soviet Union, pressure built up on them. And they made a deal with various of the quote-unquote freedom fighters who had been opposing them. And the result was the new Republic of South Africa, which we have today, wherein the Afrikaners are a um, menace minority people and have built places like this one uh, to be safe in. But the funny thing is, in the town of, in the, there's a town in the Orange Free State, I can't think of the name, Kronstadt maybe, there is a uh, Catholic, uh, a Catholic monastery, uh, an oratory no less, that dedicates itself to working for the cult, for the conversion, the cultivation of the Boers. After apartheid ended, uh, the uh, having been Calvinists, you know, the the Boers had this. Um, the Boers had this notion of themselves as the chosen people, as Calvinist peoples tend to. But they lost that, you see, when they were when the apartheid state was broken. And that has allowed a uh, uh, <laughs> that is pathetic. Yeah. The fall of the apartheid uh, regime really broke the uh, to a great degree the Calvinist heart of the Boers and opened up the way for their evangelization by the church, which was not possible before. And so to this day we have the Oratory of Kroonstad and the Orange Free State, which has put out materials in uh, the Mass and various things like that and the Catechism in the Afrikaans language. Over the turn, over the many uh, centuries, the um, Dutch or the original settlers turned into what we now call Afrikaans, and they absorbed later settlers, Germans, French Huguenots, and so forth. They're an interesting people with a very rich culture, albeit Calvinist, and uh, if they didn't always uh, do the best thing, they probably deserved a bit better than they've gotten to be a conquered people. But if it results in a lot of conversions among them, then perhaps, as far as their souls are concerned, it would have been worth it. What do you think of Nelson Mandela? The best of a bad bunch. The best of a bad bunch. Okay. Um, what is Charles's, uh, David says, what is Charles's opinion on the Shakespeare authorship question? That's a cruel question to ask. I really do not believe that uh, the author of Shakespeare's works was anyone other than one William Shakespeare. Now, I, I understand there are all sorts of people advocating for various other candidates and they produce various proofs and all that. And I'm not in a position to say how valid or otherwise those proofs are. I'm just not. Uh, what I do know is that Shakespeare lived and died. Shakespeare we know about, uh, and I, I'm always happiest to take the the cover story unless it's utterly proved to be false. So you disagree with modern scholars and you feel that Shakespeare did exist? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sometimes it's a pain to be alive. Yes, I believe William Shakespeare existed. 
Okay. And you know what else? What? The day he died was the day Cervantes died in Spain. Wow. The two greatest writers, respectively, in English and Spanish, and they snuffed it on the same day. What day? Uh, what does it say, George's Day? April 23rd? Okay. I think so. Okay, uh, Mark says, Hello, new patron here. Have loved the show for a while, but now finally took the plunge and the pay cut in order to become oh. a part of the great custodial staff here at Tumblr House. Now, see, they didn't get into my mail. See, that's how special Tumblr House is. People literally pay to work here. That's why the uh, that's out. That's why the mailroom staff pilfer envelopes. But never mind. As a veteran myself, I'm well versed in all cleaning methods, from cleaning a Humvee engine in the desert with a broom to conducting area beautification with a pair of scissors. I'm your man. Anyways, on to my question. Uh, thank you, by the way, Mark. Really appreciate it. Thanks for signing up. Welcome aboard. Yeah. Anyways, on to my question. Would Charles mind speaking on his time in the Army as a guardsman, and also his time at the New Mexico Military Institute? Well, there's a lot and, and not much to say about both. Uh, I went to NIMI first, of course. I was the ROTC there. It was a two-year military college in beautiful Roswell, New Mexico. Um, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Now, on the one hand, it was a very brutal place in some ways. Uh, but I made the best friends I've ever had there. Because there's a particular closeness that comes with uh, other young men who are being put through the same kind of garbage. <laughs> and that's lasted pretty much the whole of my life. Uh, obviously, some of them have died, and that uh, that's heavy, to be honest. Because, you know, we were young men together doing impossible things. Uh, you know, the, the, the pressure between a very demanding academic schedule, a very demanding military schedule, a certain amount of physical brutality, uh, It was not easy, and it was not. It was designed not to be easy because the idea was that you might one day be commanding men in combat, and you had to be tough to do that. And so the system worked in such a way as to exploit your weaknesses and make you crack if um, you weren't up to it. And of course, nobody is perfect, so. It also forced you, and this is an important leadership skill, to make friends quickly. Because you you couldn't survive without doing that. It was just not possible. Uh, there was no place at the Institute for the withdrawn person. You really needed to, to force yourself out. If you were an introvert, you needed to get out there and make friends. If you were an extrovert, you were already ahead of the game. Um, when from time to time we would lose a cadet um, to an honor offense which was lying cheating or stealing or some other really big deal uh, that has the march of shame and the the the, uh, uh, the uh, silent supper silent soupy we call it uh, which was a very uh, unpleasant ceremony Later, of course, the the um, when you graduated from there, those who were counter cadets became second lieutenants in the National Guard or the Army Reserve. My time in the uh, in the Guard was not all that long. Um, in the uh, fabulous 40th Division, in California, because you know. Being a guardsman in those days wasn't much. It, this is the immediate aftermath, or almost immediate aftermath of Vietnam. It was thought unthinkable that we would ever fight another war that was not World War III again. And under the so-called Abrams Doctrine, the armed forces were organized 
so that Vietnam could not recur. Uh, in order for a uh, for the United States to go to war again, it would have to be a war where the, the popular support was so great it would basically be like World War II again. Yeah. So the only prospect of that happening when I was in the guard in the early 80s was um, the World War III. Uh, uh, less than that, it couldn't happen, we thought. And so, you know, we had our monthly, uh, our monthly drills and our uh, two weeks um, AT in the at Fort Irwin in the fabulous California desert, uh, and we had a full social schedule. We had balls, we had dining in, and things like that, which were all all very enjoyable. But we used to say, "Sleep well, America. Your National Guard does." Uh, it is, you know, everything changed twenty years later. Uh, the forever war began, and the guard and the reserves became quickly deployed overseas. You know, in Vietnam, only a single National Guard unit was ever sent over. Okay. But the the guard and the Army Reserve were a f fully engaged part of the forever war. Hmm. So, anyhow, that's that's pretty much what it was like. I was there when we had the transition from sea rats, the, the canned food, to... Uh, uh, the uh, MR, MR, uh, MREs, meals rejected by Ethiopians, which actually were, were better than most of the uh, most of the sea rats, canned rations. Uh, of all the canned rations, the sea rats, the one I found the most frightening, because the cans would have these very terse descriptions of what the contents were supposed to be, the one I always found frightening was chicken or turkey chopped. Now, they didn't know what it was. How do we know it was either? That's unsettling. I thought so. And the canned spaghetti, I could eat if it was cooked. But when we ate it raw, which we most often did, it always gave me heartburn, which the other stuff didn't. But for some reason, the, the canned spaghetti always gave me heartburn. Hmm. I bet that's a painful thing for you to hear about as an Italian, canned spaghetti. Uh, no. I mean, there, there are knockoffs to everything. Well, how do you feel about Chef Boyardee? I don't feel any feelings when it comes to Chef Boyardee. He's, I mean, he's, uh, well, he's French, right? No, he's, he's Italian. Italian. I <laughs> he's... I'm sure you're very nostalgic about him because his stuff isn't in action anymore. It's not about how I feel. It's about how you as an Italian dealt with the, the reality of canned spaghetti. I didn't. All right. Uh, Will says, hi, which style of church architecture is Charles's favorite? Oh, that's hard. That is so hard because there's so many. Rococo? Oh, yeah. It, is uh, there a Rococo church? The one you're church? not supposed to. What? You're not supposed to like Rococo, but I do very much. No, but church architecture. Yeah, I know. Is there a Rococo church? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, they have these pilgrimage churches, especially in Central Europe, that are Rococo. I mean, you go in there and you feel like you're in a drug-induced hallucination. They're amazing. Are you for real? Yeah. Okay. I, I can't tell anymore ever since that, that episode way back when uh, we ended up calling it Rococo Train Station. Yes, that was a little, <laughs> that was a little weird. So, but they do have Rococo churches. I'll show you after the, after the show. I'll show you a, a few pictures of them. You'll see. They're really they're wild, but they're lovely. But, I mean, you, you've got Romanesque. You've got Gothic. You've got Renaissance. Uh, you've got Baroque. Rococo. Classicist, neo gothic, uh, arts and crafts, art nouveau, art deco, and I love them all. Even you ha you have to pick one. Oh, I do I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, fine. Neo gothic. Okay. What are examples of neo gothic? What aren't examples of neo gothic? Um, 
the uh, Church of the uh, the Church of the Advent in uh, in Boston, uh, the Cathedral of Saint John the Divine in New York. Um, What's Saint Patrick's? Prince Neil Gallen. Oh, okay. I didn't want to mention St. Patrick's, though. Why? It was my mother's parish when she was a girl. Why would that make you not want to mention that? I shouldn't bring undue advertising. It would be seen as improper. Okay, yeah, what, better watch out for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, very good, Charles. All right, one final question from Patrick. All right. Could Charles explain the practice of the system of distributism in Peru under Juan Velasco Alvarado and Peruanis, Peruani, Peruanismo. 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 And it's... what is Charles' thought on the so-called third, third way systems of economics and politics? That's kind of a complex thing. Basically, uh, Alvarado was a military uh, dictator in Peru, overthrew the civilian government, but unlike most Latin American military regimes at that time, and there were a lot of them, his was left-wing while they were right-wing. Okay. So he, uh, he became very close to uh, Cuba and the Soviet Union. But uh, his politics were primarily centered on uh, nationalization of private industry and so forth. And... Uh, Running it through the uh, running it through the uh, the government, mm -hmm. so it was it was a more socialist version of quote unquote distributism than you'd see in most places. Uh, but he he uh, was very anti communist. He was certainly a Catholic, and then he was overthrown by another another general after five years. And uh, well, well, slow down. Uh, so. He was close with Cuba and the Soviets, but he was also anti-communist. In terms of internal communists, yeah. In foreign policy, he was close to international communism, but he repressed it at home. A little bit like FDR. What? Uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yeah, I know. How? Okay. Wouldn't the world react and say, hey, you're not spreading the seed of communism? In your like, like, how can you be close with Russia while you're undermining the communist effort in your own country? By uh, well, again, by being worth more, uh, the the KGB would tolerate that. The Soviets would tolerate that on the part of regimes whose cooperation was more important to them than aiding the communists there. Yeah, and so in Peru, they had a non-communist ally. But nevertheless, was anti-American, so they cultivated that. Okay. Uh, in other words, sheer pragmatism. Remember, they're very pragmatic. They don't care about throwing people to the dogs. They really could care less. So the end result with, with all of this is that he called this the third way between socialism and capitalism. Uh, it didn't really work too well. And that was one reason why he was deposed. Now, as far as the third way goes, that is, uh, it's been used by a lot of different uh, thinkers and writers and some few leaders to describe a political and or economic system, which is third way between communism and capitalism. And distributism, solidarism, uh, Guild socialism, all those kinds of things, have been proposed as third way or third position. So, where where would the United States fall in this categorization? No, well, capitalists. I, I mean, I, I know Bill Maher. Well, Bill Maher has said that we're quasi. Uh, I mean, we're quasi socialists. Do yes. you think that's fair? Yes, I do. Okay. I do think so, and we'll become even more so. So, so isn't that between, isn't that almost, so are we the third way? No. No, we are, uh, Bellick would say we are the logical conclusion of what capitalism will lead to and what socialism will lead to. As far as, see, that's why Bellick wrote The Servile State. Yeah. Was to show that these two supposedly opposed systems 
nevertheless would end up producing the same sort of horror. Ah, interesting. Okay, available at tumblrhouse.com. Um, okay, that's interesting. So, so what does that look like? The third way. I, I still don't understand what mechanisms of um, Alvarado's method place it in this spot. Well, the uh, the uh, government control, while very powerful, was not all pervasive, and private industry still had a voice in its own management. That was one thing. Um, okay, isn't that United States? See, a great deal of direction without ownership by government of industry. Oh, 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 so the government gave direction without ownership. Okay. I mean, there was some ownership. They expanded what they owned a great deal. But there were things that they did not. But where they did not take over, they did insist on directing policy. Okay, now I'm really confused because I thought this was sort of like a command economy. I thought that sounds like a command economy to me. No. Well, I thought that's right wing. Well, see, this is the funny thing. You would also think, because it was a military coup, that it was right wing. The only thing that made it left wing was that they were allied to the Soviets and the Cubans. Sounds like it. Yeah. And it was a way of uh, cocking and snook at the United States. Okay. I don't know if I like labels uh, for economics. You, you don't like labels that don't work? No, I don't, I don't like that. It makes it very confusing. Even when they don't work and they're kind of inaccurate? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Suit yourself. I mean, I like labels that do work. I mean, Austro-fascist. Uh, um. Psh, <laughs> psh, 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 psh. I've got to wake you up somehow. For this moment, I'm Batman. You're Robin. <laughs> oh, right. Like the, you know, yeah. Austro, you see Robin. Austro-fascist. There it is. Yeah. What makes you think I was sleeping? Oh, <laughs> oh man. Um, okay, that's it for this no, episode. No, it's not it. Why are you lying it's to the it. people? No, it's not it. Why are you lying to the people like that? I am not lying to the it, It's over, Charles. Oh, you think so? Yeah. All right, sing me a Thanksgiving song, and it's over. I'm not saying life is over. I'm saying this show is over. Oh, see, he wants the reason, ladies and gentlemen that he wants to beat an early retreat is because he hasn't bought the turkey yet. And Mrs. Frankini is not happy about it. Okay, now that's actually now that's actually a lie. We have a 17-pound turkey. I was just discussing it with my mom, and we were, we were discussing how to prepare it well. They have a 17-pound turkey, and they're keeping it in the bathtub. Mom, Charles is lying about you. On the show, they've got a 17-pound carp, and it's flopping around the yard. Mom, <laughs> Charles is making offensive stereotypes about your culture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> fine, they've got the turkey, and they're going to have a great Thanksgiving. <laughs> but uh, seriously, though, we do have, as you know, this, this week is uh, careening to an end. This month is coming to an end, and we have um, next year we'll be on the twenty third. I think the twenty the twenty third is also, however, the feast of Saint Columban, my ooh my family saint. Uh, it'll be ten years that Brother Leonard Mary died. Wow! On that day, uh, the twenty second is Saint Catherine. I believe, uh, Saint Catherine is it? And then the 25th is St. Clement of Rome. I think, this, but the 30th, next week, for all of you Scotsmen out there, November 30th, St. Andrew's Day. And then, you know what happens? December. Advent. Byzantine Advent starts this week, I think. St. Philip's fast. So you can start fasting now if you want. I think the Coptics start, too. Oh, the Coptics, uh, yeah. 
They, 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 <laughs> the cops fast all the time, seemingly. I I was involved with a group which um, a number a number of, of cops amongst its members, and every time they got the uh, the cops had certain months that they wanted to host it. Every time the cops would ho the cops would host it, it would be. It's a cold salad. Basically. Yeah, special food. Yeah, because they can't eat anything. There, it's vegan. Yeah, mandated. So, we took the good with the bad, and we suffered along with our Coptic brethren. Sure. So, yeah. The uh, of course, you know, one of the one of the problems of the cops here in Arcadia. Cops or cops? Anyway, well, let me see what else we got. December is coming. Advent, Christmas. Oh. You excited for Black Friday? You gonna go in and get get some deals? Do you like the deals, Charles, from the shops? I am not going to be anywhere near a store on Black Friday. Oh, you don't care about people and you don't care about charity. Pretty much. And give. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I could care less. I couldn't care less. And I and if I could care less, nobody would know how. No, I'm I'm I don't care about Black Friday. I don't get anywhere near stores. That's ridiculous. That's nonsense. Let me tell you something. One of the great things about the Thanksgiving weekend when I was a boy was that you had these four straight days coming up with no school. It's funny. I thought you were going to say four straight days of turkey. Where it's, you have turkey, well, and then too. you have turkey sandwiches, and then you have turkey soup, and then you have turkey Turkey soup. stew. Well, that was also true. <laughs> okay. But you had no school. Uh, your dad would like to be home for work all four days. I mean, what was not to like? Yeah. And now Black Friday is there to mess it up. And so it doesn't I, mess it up. You still have your day off. No, but you don't have the whole family sitting at home recovering from uh, overeating. Well, that's true. And watching, you know, watching old movies and so on. Yeah, that's true. So we've lost that. Yeah. Anyway, well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be here next week in the old studio. Uh, but remember, if it's Monday, it's off the menu. And the soul you save may be your own. See you next time, everyone. God bless.